Welcome back everyone. If you're new here, my name is Brian Jenks, and today we're going to talk about Mermaid.js. Mermaid.js can be used to make flowcharts, sequence diagrams, and a lot of other visualizations within documents. It is actually a JavaScript library that can be included into a variety of applications or web pages, but because it's a JavaScript library, Electron applications like Obsidian can actually use Mermaid.js to create flowcharts within Markdown space. So that's what we're going to cover today is actually using mermaid diagrams within Obsidian for whatever purpose you may have and some of the options that are available to you. So diving right in, uh, mermaid.js is a JavaScript library, like I said. It's here on GitHub and there is a lot of great examples on some of the options available to you on the readme for the repo. And it's just, you know, mermaid.js is the uh, organization and then mermaid is the repo. So you can get here through this link and I'll probably put a link to that in the pinned comment below. So there are a couple tools with mermaid that I'm going to showcase today and show how I use it. So the mermaid live editor is a tool created by the people who made mermaid. <clears throat> and you can actually use this to test out what your flowchart's going to look like. So you can see like you have different nodes here, the content, and it actually displaying. So if we wanted to say, hey, um, F is for car here. So car, we're gonna say, hey, we're gonna take F and point that at a new node called, um, let's say G, and G has the contents of hello. And you can actually see these nodes being previewed live. So in this case, you can actually see a live preview. <clears throat> if you're doing this in Obsidian, you can do this uh, at the same time if you just have uh, two different portions of the same window open. So let's just do, um, let's go to my workbench. Okay, so I have the same copy of the file open in two locations. I have the edit and the preview. So in here, I could easily insert a mermaid chart and then have it displayed as well as edit it at the same time. So I'm going to say um, A is uh, hello and I can't spell at all. And then hello is gonna point to the B node and the B node is gonna say, world. And in that case, you can actually do the same thing <clears throat> in Mermaid uh, within Obsidian by having just the same file open in two locations. So that is uh, a tool that Mermaid provides to you, the live Mermaid editor. But as for like all the options available to you, where can you find information on what exactly can you do with this? Because this is some interesting stuff. You can probably get some ideas from the syntax here, but we want some more comprehensive documentation and we want to see some good examples as well as uh, how can we use this in a more advanced way to have some great results and uh, some more advanced functionality. And so where that comes in is the actual uh, Git documentation for Mermaid and it is a lot of documentation. And I actually use this for our markdown flow charts. I may have made a video on that. If I did, I'll put it up in a card, but for uh, mermaid charts, it actually works in pretty much anything you can put JS into. So our markdown actually has support for it. You can do uh, the diagram R package to create flow charts. And a lot of this documentation, it's the same across wherever you're gonna put it, just some differences between HTML and markdown syntax. So mermaid can be used in a variety of ways. We can insert it into a website. We can use it in our markdown. We can use it on a CLI client. And we actually have support within Markdown for these Electron applications that use the library like Obsidian. So we're gonna really gonna focus on how we can actually use this and the features we can use within Obsidian and not just all of the tools. So we're gonna keep this sort of specific to the Obsidian app and the Obsidian community. So a lot of the uh, stuff we wanna look at today is in the diagram and syntax examples. And for diagrams, I normally stick usually with flow charts, but we're gonna to touch on a few of the other types of charts today. But the ones I tend to use the most are just flow charts because the syntax is super easy. It's easy to understand exactly what it's doing. And uh, it's just what I've been most familiar with, but we're gonna branch out a little bit today. So let's take a look at some of the syntax introduction. And uh, you can see right here, I actually showed this live example about like a node pointing at another node. You don't even have to name these nodes but if they are not, I think, if there are uh, multiple words, so if I actually went to my index file, if there are multiple words, yeah, you can only have a single word as a node. If it's a multiple word, you actually need to have it in some sort of enclosing syntax with an ID. <clears throat> and that ID 
is what like this A, B syntax, these are actually the names of the nodes. So you can see like you got um, brackets here and that actually says what the interior syntax is or the content. And then B is, and C are actually the names of these nodes. So I'm gonna cover two different types of diagrams here. Some of these other ones are pretty advanced and I've never used them, so I'm, not, I'm just not gonna talk about them. But I will talk about a pretty easy one to do, which is pie charts. You know, we have a, you know, a colon separated value syntax. We have like the, the title, the label, and the actual value. So we can see like if you know you can say the title of a pie chart and then just some values and it's going to represent those values. So let's actually look at this uh, opened up and um, we can actually preview this at the same time so we can actually see what we're working on as we're writing it. Obviously there's an error because I'm still typing it. So we could do pi and then we're gonna say, you know, title, uh, let's actually just say, uh, hmm, what should we make this? Let's call it content. And then we're gonna do YouTube and the dot colon and the value for YouTube, we're gonna say 70%, 70. And then we're gonna say, Twitch, and we're gonna say that one is 30. And then I might have to say pie chart, no, pie. So then uh, we have to say title after, is what I messed up there, it's title. So in that case, now we have you know a content pie chart and it's broken down by those two values, YouTube and Twitch. And then uh, let's say we wanna change this one to 50. And now we have, um, and so it tries to break it out to 100%. So if you do, don't have it adding up, it's going to be a little bit of weird behavior there. We're going to say Twitter here, and then we need another 20 to add up to a total, and then the breakdown is exactly what you would expect. And this is it, this is it. Just the title of the pie chart and the values that make up the sum total of 100%. So this could be anything like 5, 3, 2, and that's the same thing as adding up the actual values because this is just displaying a proportion, a percentage. So it doesn't actually show like the the number of the values, just the proportion of the total. So 50 is obviously 50% of 100. So that is pie charts. The next type of diagram I'm gonna cover is the journey diagram. So this one actually will work in Obsidian. It apparently is a fairly newer diagram type and depending on the library of Mermaid that's actually used in Obsidian, some things that are newer might not be present or functional. But with this one, I already ran into an issue where I tried to have, you know, have a line break in here to make it a little bit more readable in the fenced area for the mermaid code. This actually does not work. You can't have those new line breaks. So that was the error I made. But the journey graph is actually really interesting. You know, it's gonna show like different sections of, of tasks, uh, what you did, and you can actually rate it like with a mood. And it looks like the, the mood is really on a five point scale of, uh, or maybe it's a six point scale, one to five, zero to five. And that's when you actually see like the most changes in these like little emoticon or emojis, smiley face uh, of like, you know, you know, those doctor charts you always see where it's like, do you feel like a mm, zero or a ha ah, 10? So it's kind of like that, I guess, but I digress. So we're gonna say journey and the name of the journey is, let's call this, the title of the journey is gonna be um, my working day. I'm gonna copy that at least from this, so section. I could say um, work. And what did I do at work? Let's just say, okay, I, I wrote code and then let's give that a three because code is frustrating and me. I'm guessing if you did something else other than me, you might actually have some other entity here. So actually let's do um, also wrote, wrote code. And we could say four and then her and so yeah, so you actually have, uh, if you did a different entity at the end, you can actually have um, the same, you know, it's all for work, but then two different entities, two different values, and then the same um, section. But in any case, I'm gonna say uh, me again. I also wrote code, code more. And then we're gonna say another section. So we're gonna say section, and then we're gonna say Twitch, and we're gonna say streamed. We're gonna give that a five because you guys are awesome to stream for. And then also me. When I render that, you can see now, it's kind of hard to see here just because of the colors. Um, but what we ha would have is, you know, we have two different sections of the sections on the top line. And actually I will move this over to the live mermaid editor so you can see it better, but it renders in Obsidian. It could just be my color theme, which is fine. 
But in the live editor for Mermaid, we could say journey, and we'll make this full screen here. So you could say, hey, work, I wrote code, I also wrote some more code. We have different values because it's a three and a four, three, four, and you can see it gets, it's a five point scale, basically happier and then less happy. And then a second section, and the section is Twitch. So you can see it's now a new color. And as we continually make additional sections, um, also test, let's get that a three and a me. So you can see how we have additional sections and it just shows you throughout your day, like, okay, in the work section, we have one task, two tasks. And then it'll also show you the different entities uh, that we have for those items for each of those sections. And in this case, you can show like your working day. You can do this for your, your team. You could do this for yourself. You could do this for some sort of storyboarding for some fiction you're writing or something like that. Uh, a lot of things you can do with this and a fairly simple and minimal syntax. All right, so next I'm going to talk about flowcharts. Flowcharts are basically what I use Mermaid for the most. It's a very meaty topic. It's uh, a lot of stuff we can do with flowcharts. And to get started, all you really need is just this. So for a simple chart, a simple flowchart, all we really need to do is say, hey, make a graph, what kind of graph? And this little acronym here, you know, TD, TB, it's top down or top to bottom. And uh, it really just changes the orientation. We have left, right, or right, left. And you know, you have these specific orientations. I usually just do top down, but I have used a left, right for my map of mock for uh, my index on Obsidian. So let's just do TD for top down and you can see right in here, nothing's rendering yet, nothing's rendering, because because we need some nodes. So for nodes, what you can do is if it's a single word, like start and stop, all we have to do is just put those words there. And we'll get into some more advanced functionality later. So if I said start, you know, oh wait, there's a node. Okay, that's it. But now we need to connect it to something. So I could say, you know, with uh, two lines, you know, errors for now, I could add a bracket here for an arrow, and then I'll actually add an arrow. Or if you just did three dashes, it would just be a line. But let's see what arrow looks like. And I can say end. So then once we add a ending node with stop, if you put the word end, it'll actually cause an error because some of the syntax in Mermaid is the word end. So what we can do here is say, hey, start, hey, stop. Those are two different names of nodes. We're not giving them IDs. We're just saying the content. So the content has to be a single word. And we can point at it with an arrow. That's why we have a little arrow uh, mark uh, a little arrow rendered there. And if I get rid of that and I add another dash, it'll just be a line, no arrow. If I add equal signs and add an arrow, it'll be a thicker line. If I add a line and then two of those, nothing happens. Uh, one thing we can do is we can actually point this at something uh, for a display of text on that line. You can just add two pipes and put some text in here. And now you actually have the display of some text on that line pointing to stop from start. And we can, again, same, th same thing. This is like markdown syntax for flowcharts. I could add uh, equal signs for a thicker line, or we could then say, hey, stop is going to go with a just a line to, now let's add some more text. We're gonna say uh, YouTube, add another piece of text there. And then what's the ending node? We're gonna say uh, go over. Oh, two words, doesn't work. Let's see, how can we get around that? Can we do snake case? Yes, we can do snake case. So in this case, you can actually see, it's exactly what you would what you would think, a thin line with no arrow, some actual displayed text on that line and the ending node. So that is very simple. In a nutshell, what we're doing, we're saying, hey, this points to that. So then that can point to that and you can just continue on. Well, this is a straight line. Well, we want some branching because it's a flow chart. You could flow in multiple ways. So what we could do with this is we could say, hey, stop is also going to point to, uh, let's just say, uh, over there. And that's all we need to do. So now we have a branch. And it's just as easy as left hand points to right hand, or left side points to right side. And so you just repeat the same things. Now the only issue is if without actual IDs and using the content, the content has to be like snake case or um, like a stop. And then what you also need to do after that is make sure that these IDs are unique. Now, if they're unique, you just continue to repeat them and then point them at something else. So as long as the left-hand side points to the right-hand side and these are you know, the same label, it'll work. So stop is the, exactly the same. Now, if I change this to a capital, it's different. 
So that's an issue is that if you're not using those IDs, but you're using the content and the content has to be a single word or a snake case or dash separation word, no space is allowed, then you could have some issues and some aberrant behavior. What you want to do is likely use unique IDs for each of these nodes and then just reference those IDs, not the content of that node. And what that would allow you to do is actually use multiple words. So I could say, hey, this over there node, I want it to be both words, but I actually need to actually say it has an ID and it has some content within that ID. So what I could do with that is I could say, hey, the ID A is within some square brackets here. And now we have a another node. These square nodes are just square brackets, but now I have a multi-word piece of content is a node. And there we go. So we're dealing with different displays of lines, whether it has arrows or not, how to reference a specific node or repeat references to other different nodes for branching purposes, displaying text on the line, and we're still just scratching the surface here. We also have different syntaxes like markup on these content pieces of the nodes. And what this will let you do is change the display of what shape it is. For instance, you're seeing a square block of the, for this node here. And what I wanna do is I'm gonna change the bracket, square brackets to curly brackets or curly braces. And that makes it a diamond. Awesome. So we can actually change what the syntax is of these shapes just by what's it, what they're enclosing. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna start over with this. We're gonna make it super simple. We're gonna say, hey, a top-down graph, just an A. So what's displayed is just the letter A. But that A is actually gonna be our ID. So inside this ID, I'm gonna say, hey, we're gonna give it some contents with the square brackets. And then inside the square brackets, we're gonna say content. Great, riveting. So what we're gonna do with this now is we're gonna point this at another ID. So I'm gonna say, hey, this is going to point to the node, if I can get my key to work, B. And inside B is going to be a um, hello. All right, that's, that's cool. We've made two different IDs. They, those IDs have nodes with content. And then what we can start doing is say, hey, we're gonna make a new node. We're gonna make C. And so we're gonna say, hey, B is gonna point to C. And inside C is gonna be world. And so what we can do with that is now I don't have to type out all of B's content. I can just start using just the names of the nodes. And this also makes it easier to reference something unique and to minimize uh, missing up a piece of the case or spelling mistakes to cause duplication if all of your nodes are just single words. So with that, very simple way of, of envisioning how we're going to use these nodes to reference each other and create a diverting flowchart of uh, different branches. So B can also point to D, which says branch. And there you go. Now you have a simple branch and you're just using nodes. It's less, less syntax to type and it's easier and a more robust referencing because you're using unique IDs. Now going through the documentation, we're gonna see a lot of different shapes here. Now the shapes, I really don't use too many of them, but honestly, there's so many you can use. Uh, the default is a square. So you can see this little square node here and you get that just from the square brackets. Now, if I changed a node to have parens, uh, that would actually give you a rounded edge square. So hello is now, ha now has rounded, rounded edges. But if we did a um, square bracket here, and I think it will wrap, yes. So now if I wrap the square brackets with parens, it now does this you know, pill shape. That's pretty cool. If we did double brackets, this actually, I wonder if this would actually cause aberrant behavior in Obsidian, because if we do that, okay, we'll actually display this, but then if we render the chart, actually, I don't think it'll cause problems because yeah, it doesn't render that as a link inside of a code space here, which is good. So we can actually render this uh, subroutine shape with the little lines there. If we wanted to do a database, we could easily wrap with square brackets on the outside, parens on the inside, and now we have a database diagram or referencing that database. If we wanted to do a circle, we could say D points to E, which is double parens and circle. And we can easily do that. And then we also have a, I do like to use this as the completed shape. Like at the end of my workflow is this like victory flag, uh, asymmetric shape here. Um, this is what I use basically just to, to end my, my flows. This is like the, the victory flag. So we're gonna say that D is gonna point to F and F is going to be that uh, flag. 
And so it's just a greater than symbol and then an ending square bracket for the flag. It actually is intuitive of the shape, you know, the bracket and the uh, square bracket. Um, you can also use, I'm not sure why this is called a rhombus, it's a diamond, but you can do that with a curly brace. So we could say that a flag is gonna go to, um, let's call this uh, EFG, that's the next alphabet. Um, we're gonna say, hey, a single curly brace and we're gonna say diamond. And you can see that now we're starting to get some different shapes here. Uh, hexagon node is the same as diamond, just with an additional one. So actually, I'm going to make another branch here. I'm going to say A is going to go to double brace, and we're going to say uh, hexagon. And we need to actually give it a node name, H, and there we go. So now we have this uh, hexagonal shape. And really, none of these are something specific that you need to say, oh, I have to use it for this purpose. It, these are all different shapes. You can use them for your own purposes. So you could say, hey, whenever I come across this database diagram, it's a database. Or um, when it's a hexagon, that's a specific action that I needed to take in that workflow or that diagram. So really, it, how you set this up is really up to you. Um, I don't use a lot of these shapes. It's just a certain few ones that I would recognize as that's what that type of step, step is, that's what I use. Um, you can do parallelogram. That's again, just with square brackets, a lot of square brackets. Um, H goes to I, and then we have the square bracket with two forward slashes, and then inside those slashes we have um, parallel, and so that's, and you can see like how easy this markup syntax is. Like it's it's basically markdown, but for flowchart nodes and the content in them, and that, it's, it's that easy. Like you can look up this documentation and just go to the flowchart section, and these examples are very well laid out. Obviously I'm reviewing them here, but you can find all the different things that you want. Like look at all of this stuff for just flowcharts. So we have our different nodes of different shapes. And I already talked about how we could actually add text overlaid in between these pieces of, uh, in between these nodes. So between content and hexagon here, I'm gonna add a piece of content. So it's just the two pipes. I could say inside there, here is some text, uh, text. And now we have some text on that line, but we can also do text on uh, on those lines, but in broken up between them. So you can see that we did this one here, where we just put the pipes in between uh, the arrow or the point or the line and the actual node it referenced. But what we're gonna do with this one is we can actually add it between, but just by continuing the line. Personally, why would you do that one? You could just, I mean, I guess it for separation, I mean, visually separating it, that makes sense. One thing I might wanna do is not have to type as many additional characters. Um, and I'm not even sure that it really likes this right here because it doesn't look like it's liking it. So yeah, I just stick with the pipes that way because that just makes it easy to see the syntax as it as it is that way. Um, yeah, so this one is not liking the additional lines. I guess if I did that, no, oh yeah. So just keep the lines that way. You can label it with this and break it up with the two pipe characters. And it, basically whatever's on the left-hand side is what the, the arrow is still gonna be, it's just the text is overlaid on top of it. So if I wanted this straight line between content and hexagon here to be not just a line, but an arrow, I could just add a bracket there and now it's an arrow. The text is still overlaid, the arrow points to the text, but what's actually rendered is that text on top of the line and that line pointing to the node, which is a hexagon. So in that way, like this is the easy syntax of just adding some text explaining what your node might be doing in that you know, form of processing. We can also make dotted lines by using um, the middle character here as a period. So I could say for this thick line, we're gonna add a dot there and it doesn't work that way. But if we change these to thin lines, it'll now be a dotted line. And it's just by adding instead of another uh, dash here, well actually with this one, because you have an arrow, you just have a, a dash that way. But if we had three lines, change that to a dot, it would be that way. So really it's just the third character is either a line if you just want a dotted line, but if you want the dotted arrow, then it, you actually need to have an additional character, whereas normally it's just uh, the two dashes in the arrow. So with that, we can have a dotted arrow line. And the same thing here, we could break up text in this weird way, and we can have thicker lines with the equal signs. So we could easily just do two equal signs and then have a thicker line with that way. And if we remove the bracket, we can have just a thick straight line. So all the ways of just point, pointing with lines at different nodes. And it's, it's that easy to make these lines. And we can diff, easily reference different nodes and describe dependencies this way. So 
uh, A is going to B and B is saying and A and C is going to D. So with this, we could say, hey, A is pointing to both B and C, but C is pointing to D. Um, and actually, this one is actually even more complex because it's saying B is also pointing to D. So with this example, let's just start over from scratch here. Um, just to have A and B. And so we're going to say and C with a circle. And we're going to say C is pointing to D, which is just uh, square. And so now we have you know, A is pointing to B and C and D. So this way, like to be honest, personally, I probably would never use this just because that's actually a little confusing of syntax. And that what I would probably do is just manually declare each node going to its connection point, like A pointing to B, A pointing to C, C pointing to D, B going to D. And that's actually a clearer way. Yeah, it's more verbose. It's a lot of extra content, but it's clearer. And for me, I prefer the clarity if I'm gonna be frank about it. And they represent that here as well, like the exact same sort of concept here, A to C, A to D. And then the same thing there, it's exactly that. Um, you could also have different, now well, this is beta. I'm not sure if this will be working in Obsidian, but one thing we can test is these new arrows. So instead of an arrow point, we can just do an O. So that's just still doing an arrow, but we also have an X. Yeah, so no, they, these new beta arrow types are not currently supported in Obsidian. Um, so, oh well with that. And yeah, that's gonna be it for linking between the nodes. Um, next, we're going to talk about uh, special characters that break and subgraphs in the flowcharts. So special characters that will break your obsidian chart, or your obsidian charts, your mermaid charts. Um, you can have certain characters within the graphs or in the nodes. So for instance, the content of this one has within uh, double, parent, double uh, quotes the text, but the text also has a uh, parens. But what happens if you want to actually show an escaped quote character, like you want to actually have a double quote? Well, you can actually use some of these escape sequences like that are common in actual HTML code. Uh, and so what we can do with that is we can also just do like this special character, this heart emoji. You can also do that just by this escape code. So what we could do is we could say, you know, B says hello, and we can also add that escape character. So it's a hash 9829, um, 829, and then a semicolon. And it looks like on Mac it breaks, but for other uh, systems it might actually display but for this escape sequences this is what you're probably going to do oh it might actually be because it needs a double quotes maybe but um, it might just be uh, font issues with mac no it just needed double quotes so interesting so it looks like with the escape sequences you actually also need double quotes around the content itself and then it will actually render these special um, escapes now one thing we can also do with uh, these nodes is you can escape a, a quote with the same sort of syntax but if you wrap it in double quotes because it's a lot of extra content, yeah, so be careful of some of these symbols that can break, especially if you're going to do some of the special characters that actually f uh, format the actual nodes themselves. One of the really cool things we can do is actually subgraphs, where you can see like these are three different charts broken out. All we really need to do for that is just say subgraph1, and then below this we can say end. And now all you have to do is basically open up a container for this graph. So with this graph, we just have subgraph one, it has two nodes, and then this is, you know, here's the title. So we could also just say um, graph one, if I can spell, there we go. So graph one, and that's it. So now we actually wanna make a second one, and let's see what that would look like. So we could say subgraph two, uh, actually let's just say graph two, and within this graph, we're gonna have uh, two nodes. I'm gonna end it, so there we go. And then we're gonna say two nodes. So we're gonna say C and hello, and C is gonna to point to D, and D is gonna say world. Cool, but now we have two separated graphs. So they're side by side, two different subgraphs, but like you can see here, these nodes can point to each other. So below all of this, you know, outside of the subgraph area, I could just say, hey, A is gonna point to D, and there you go, that's it. Content is pointing to world here, and that's it. So we can define these subgraphs of everything we want inside this encapsulated little picture of a graph, and then outside of those, um, those namespace areas, we can actually use the same syntax to mark up these lines, dotted or otherwise, to actually point at these nodes in between different graphs, all just by saying, hey, encapsulate this one here, that one there, 
and now start linking the nodes across them, but outside of that referenced area. So next, one of the really useful things that I actually use in my Obsidian uh, flowcharts with Mermaid is this callback function. Now, one thing you can do here is this JavaScript, I haven't tested this in Obsidian and for what I actually would use it for, um, I actually haven't needed it. You can let me know if that works or not. But one thing you can do is this little action right here. You can see it says click B, B is a node that exists, a link, a hyperlink, and a tooltip for the link. So let's actually do this for node D. So for D, we're gonna say click D, and what we're gonna put in here is, um, actually, let's just do my website, cool. And then for the tooltip, we're gonna say Brian's website. Cool, so now when I hover over this node, it should give me a tooltip. It looks like this part of functionality is not part of, oh, maybe it wasn't, uh, I didn't have it selected. No, so that apparently it is not function in Obsidian, but the links do. So if I click this world uh, node here, it'll actually open up that hyperlink to my website. That's really cool. So we can actually hyperlink to different sites, but where I actually use this in Obsidian and where it's also really powerful is Obsidian has URIs, which is those uniform resource links, I think is what it stands for. And what, we're, what that allows us to do is if you're on your desktop, uh, application of Obsidian. So this doesn't work for Obsidian Publish. If you do it on a Publish, which my um, my site is actually on Publish, it does not work with that. And yeah, so what we can do is I can say, hey, let's open up another file. And I'm going to open up, let's say, um, let's do, let's just do my index. And we're going to say index. I'm going to put that over here. So we wanna open up the index, but what I can do here is in the ellipsis, I can say, hey, copy my obsidian URI, or maybe it's URL, or it's capitalized I, either way. So with that, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to close that, that page now. So I'm gonna close it. And up in the flow chart, let me make this visible here. So up in the flow chart now, instead of saying, hey, click this hyperlink, which is you know an external URL through a website, I'm going to post that URI, or URL, whatever it is, it's probably URI. So you can see that it looks like what you see in those sometimes weird URLs, which is, it's calling an application. So normally in a server, you'd have like two uh, forward slashes or something like this, or maybe it's more, I forget, but like this basically identifies the actual application to then open up this link. So Obsidian understands this link syntax and it's going to open up my vault, the vault name knowledge, and it's gonna open up a file, that file being index.md, which is my index. Now, this will also work with things like the Zotero links. Like if you use the Zotero MD notes workflow, what we can do with that is we can actually, uh, when did I last use that uh, workflow there? Um, hmm, I don't remember. But if you actually export the notes, you'll actually get these links in Zotero that say, you know, Zotero and then the colon. And I, I talk about this in my, uh, my video on my Zotero workflow that I didn't create, but that I use. And it's the same thing. You have these links that say, hey, this application open that link. So then when we click on D, now we can see, hey, the pointer changes. It's ready to click on a link. If I click it, it opens up that file. And this is what I'm doing in the map of mock. So inside this map, you can see it, you know, it's a uh, left to right, so graph LR. Um, you can see that I have, because they're all single words, I didn't do the uh, node identities or the, the, the IDs for the nodes, which may not be the best thing in the long term, but it worked. Um, for clarity, I just did this because they're all single words. But in any case, so we have all of these different nodes and they're all pointing at each other. But when you click on a node like index, it opens up that file using the URI links. And so it's just a simple, you know, click, click that node, open up that link. And the link is just to that page in my Obsidian Vault. So clicking on YouTube, we go to YouTube, programming, goes to programming. Uh, it's the same thing. And yeah, so you can use this to open up any of the files in your Obsidian Vault or if you have multiple vaults, you tell it which vault you wanna open and what file in that vault. So in that way, you're able to link across vaults too using these URIs and using them with Mermaid flowcharts. So one thing we can do also in our flowcharts is let's say I wanna describe what graph one is actually about. So I wanna leave some comments for myself within the actual code, which is, this is what you might call the code. 
So to actually do comments with mermaid, we just do 2% signs. And I could say, here is a code comment. And you notice nothing breaks, nothing's displayed. It's just there. So we can easily mark up our you know, flowchart code with comments so we can explain what is actually happening. And there is some more advanced stuff I'm not gonna cover in these flowcharts called directives that also uses like uh, the 2% two percent signs and then some uh, curly braces, but I'm not gonna cover those. And um, yeah, they're, they're definitely in the documentation. But one thing some people are probably really going to care about is how do you make your graph you know, custom? Like I wanna change the colors, the styling, like how do I change those things? So what we can do is we can actually define custom styles and classes with uh, just what you're typically used to, sort of with CSS syntax. So let's copy some of these uh, syntaxes here. I'm not gonna type all this stuff out and make you wait, but if I just put these here, as so you can see, I have style ID one, I'm just change that to A and that to B. So really, it's just saying, hey, for node A content here, uh, we're gonna change the fill to this hex code, cool. And the stroke is gonna be um, that color, cool and the width is gonna be four pixels. Let's change this to 16 pixels. Cool, so this is basically adding a dark outline. So let's actually make this FFF, and there we go. And then we can change that to six pixels, we can change that to two pixels, and you can, you can see that it's a lot of basic CSS uh, that you're interacting with, because this is a JavaScript library. Even if it's in Markdown, Markdown is basically just a, a simple, a simplified HTML. So we could easily just add this style, this node with this. But if you wanna repeat these styles, what we could easily do is say, um, we could identify a class. So we could say, hey, let's, let's make a new class. And the class we wanna make is class define, class def, the name of the class. We're gonna call this Brian, uh, Brian's class. And we're gonna define um, that style. So I'm gonna just call this FFF for the um, stroke, for the width, we're gonna call it two pixels. And for the fill, we're gonna leave it that obnoxious pink color. So we've defined a class, the class is named Brian's class, and it has those properties of this node, what you're seeing right here. So if we remove those, they go back to normal, but the class is still defined. So then we can actually attach that class to specific nodes. I'm gonna say, hey, um, class, Brian's class, um, actually, whoops, um, we're gonna say, yeah, node A, and it's gonna say Brian's class. And now node A has that class assigned to it. But we also want this assigned to nodes, um, let's just say C and D. So I defined the class and I said, hey, this class applies to node A, what, no, what class? That one. But we can also separate and say, hey, go to C and go to D. So in this way, we're easily able to, you know, the dry method in programming. Do not repeat yourself or don't repeat yourself. And with this, we're able to say, hey, define a class, now apply it to all these nodes. And because we're not using the full you know, content, like my map of mock, where I just say, hey, I repeat the word programming every time, because it's just A, B, C, D, whatever, simple IDs, you can also take up less space, it's less clutter, easier to read, easier to understand, and it's just less characters to type. So with this, we can define these custom classes, apply those styles to those nodes, and that, that's it, you're done. You can start out playing with these different properties and mess with that, and that's it. One last note about classes is that instead of assigning classes uh, with this by saying, you know, class, colon, like that, if I wanted to do something in line and a little bit simpler, what I could do is I could easily just say, hey, we're gonna comment that out. And now I wanna actually say, hey, node A gets assigned that class. So what we could do is we could actually add three colons and then the name of the class, and that would actually apply the class to that node A. So one thing we're gonna do here is I'm gonna say, hey, A, triple colon, and that class name. And you could do that down here. Personally though, I don't really like this syntax because then you're gonna have to list out each class and then apply that each time. And I honestly don't prefer that. So what I might do is just say, hey, yeah, the class comma, and then list out the node IDs. That's simple, it's clean, it's concise, the single line, and it gets that job done. So that's, that's all for classes. Now, one last thing, and the last thing I'm gonna cover for flowcharts is the support for Font Awesome. If you have uh, Font Awesome in here, and actually, if it's saying supported, it's probably saying you know, it actually has the font embedded in the library, is we can actually embed certain Font Awesome characters by prepending F-A and colon. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this uh, text character here. And we're going to say uh, D, put this right here, D is going to point to a node titled E, whose contents is just going to be font awesome spinner. Now there's nothing in there, and it might be the same issue we ran into earlier where we need double quotes, but apparently not. So maybe uh, it's not supported right off the bat, or maybe you need to have the font installed. So let's see if we can add some additional content. Nope, it's, it's not rendering that one. So you might actually have to have the font installed to actually use it, but if you have it installed as a system font, or you have it in, you might actually be able to add this to your custom CSS for Obsidian. If you add Font Awesome to the CSS and have it supported, you could probably have these icons displayed that way. Um, either way, cool way to display some characters. Um, one thing I might actually do just to test is saying, hey, can we actually display emojis? Um, if it will display those, it doesn't look like it's going to support it. It will. So to be honest, if I was gonna just display icons, I would probably just do that. And so what we could do with this is we could also link this URI by node E, say E goes to, you know, your evergreen notes, if we could link to a tag or something that connects your tags, but either way, I could then say, hey, click the tree, you go to your index. And that's, that's all I'm going to cover today, putting in those icons into your uh, nodes or by, you know, use emojis too. whatever is supported for